You are listening to Perplexity. On the chilly night of February 24th, 1978, a group of five close-knit friends would pile into their car and go to a basketball game. The men were from Yuba City, California, and this would be the last time that the men would ever be seen alive. 24-year-old Jackie Charles Hewitt, 29-year-old William or Bill Lee Sterling, 32-year-old Theodore Ted Earl Weir, 30-year-old Jack Antone Madruga, who went by Doc, and 25-year-old Gary Dale Mathias would leave a basketball game at a local university in Chico. It seemed like a typical night for the five friends, who their families lovingly referred to as the boys, but this night would become the anniversary of their nightmare, the day that their lives would change forever. No definitive evidence has emerged to conclusively determine just what the hell happened on February 24th, 1978. This case continues to baffle investigators and captivate the public's imagination. It stands as one of the most perplexing missing persons cases in American history. Over four decades later, the men's fate remains shrouded in mystery, with many questions still left unanswered. In fact, the more I learned about this case, the more uncertain I became. In the words of the author Tony Wright, who's done extensive research on this case, quote, If you're going to research the Yuba County 5 case, you've got to accept the ache of uncertainty. Not knowing is the hardest part. The realization is that for all the research, the hours of interviews, and the data collected, we will likely never know what happened to those five men that night. What drove them into the mountains, 70 miles in the wrong direction, amid sub-freezing temperatures, wearing only spring clothes? What then made them abandon the safety of their vehicle and hike further into the wilderness instead of turning around and heading back home? End quote. This is the deep dive into the story of the Yuba County Five also known as the American Dilatov Pass Incident or the Matthias Group Incident. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Perplexity, a Mystery Podcast. As always, I am your host, Kadra, and if you are new here, hello and welcome. Thank you so much for tuning in. I tell tales every single week that have perplexed me, so if you love a good mystery that leaves you wanting more, don't worry, you're in the right place, and I would love it if you follow along if you end up enjoying this episode. And if you are a returning listener, hello my friends, welcome back. I have an insane story for you guys today. I want to thank one of my patrons, Scott, for requesting this story, Scott I don't think you realized what this would get me into, but what a rabbit hole this has been. This story is going to have to be multiple parts. I think it's going to be a three-parter, and I have not done a three-parter in a very long time since the I-45 murders, but I read a book for this case, and I watched an hour and a half long YouTube video about it. I watched a Netflix documentary. The book that I read was nearly 400 pages, and I read about 10 articles about it, and I still am so confused, but we need to talk about it. So the story, with all that being said, has to be split into multiple parts. This is arguably the deepest dive I have ever done on a story, so let me know uh, once it's all said and done if you're still with me and what you guys think about these deep dives. Who knows? I might do more in the future. And with all that being said, be sure to tune in next week for part two. In part one, I'm going to give you guys a general outline of what we know about the case. We're also going to talk in depth about the victims, and I will talk a lot about relevant background of Yuba City and the Plumas National Forest, as well as the Gateway Projects, which was a group that all of the men were involved in. Trigger warning for today's episode, this podcast is adult and will contain disturbing content, so listener discretion is advised. 
All of the sources that I used for today's episode will be down in the show notes, but I do want to give a special shout out to Tony Wright, the author of the book that I read that has kind of become known as the Yuba County Five Bible, and I would agree with that. Uh, It's incredibly detailed. The book is called Things Aren't Right, The Disappearance of the Yuba County Five. And Tony Wright interviewed all of the families at length, and so we know a lot about the victims thanks to him. He also had access to the Yuba County Sheriff's Department's uh, case files, so he outlines those in detail. So everything I'm about to tell you is largely thanks to this book. So thank you, Tony, and you guys should go read that book. So without further ado, let's get into the story of the Yuba County Five. On that fateful Friday evening... The five friends piled into Ingmadruga's Madruga's two-door light blue Montego sometime around 6 p.m. to drive to the Chico State University game. They were going to support their favorite men's basketball team, the University of California Davis Aggies. Madruga, the driver, knew the area well. He had grown up in Loma Rica and was described as a very safe driver. He was not known to take risks, and he adored his car. He had also put $3 worth of gasoline into the car before the trip. It was a relatively easy drive, one that many say the men had taken before without any issue, and it was about 50 miles from their homes to get to the university. Everything also appeared perfectly normal, according to witnesses at the Chico basketball game. The men didn't have any history of getting lost. They were also good with time management, and if they were ever running behind or going off schedule, they were known to call their families and give them a heads up. The men also had plans to look forward to the very next day. They were all highly dedicated basketball players, and they planned to compete in their own tournament the following morning at Sierra College. If they were to win this tournament, it would be a step forward in competing in the 1978 California Special Olympics in L.A., and they would have won tickets to Disneyland. Some of the men were so excited about this tournament that they laid out their beige uniforms early. Ted Weir, one of the men who would disappear, even made an entry in his personal diary about the tournament. He also purchased a pair of brand new white high top sneakers. Gary Mathias, one of the other men who would disappear, would also continuously tell his family that he was looking forward to the tournament and he wanted to be sure they would wake him up early. He wanted to be woken up at 7 a.m., and he told them, be sure I don't oversleep. But on the night the men would vanish, none of them would contact their families. Sometime after 11 p.m., Madruga's two-door Montego would get stuck in the snow on a desolate road miles away from their home in the complete opposite direction. This road was in the Plumas National Forest and the Sierra Nevada Mountains, Weir, Madruga, Sterling, and Hewitt had been incredibly close friends for several years. They did everything together. Gary Mathias had become a part of the group more recently. They were all members of the Gateway Projects, a local organization that helped people with mental disabilities and mental illness. Within the Gateway Projects, there were the Gateway Gators, their basketball team. The Yuba County Five all played on this team and were looking forward to their tournament. Four of the five men who would disappear on the night of February 24, 1978, were reported in the media to have some type of intellectual disability, and Gary Mathias had been diagnosed schizophrenic. However, through research and interviews with family, we know that these five men were quite independent and traveled frequently together without any issue. Matthias was also the only one who had a clear diagnosis. The other men, with this being the 70s, were simply rubber stamped as being disabled. Gary Matthias did have some difficulty adjusting with his schizophrenia, but in 1975, three years before the disappearance, he started seeing a doctor and he was on a regular regimen of medication. Weir, Madruga, Hewitt, and Matthias lived in Linda and Olivehurst, communities within Yuba County, while Sterling lived west of the Feather River in Yuba City. They were also all born to families that moved to California, hoping for a better life. The five men were loved and respected by all who knew them, 
and they came from hardworking blue-collar families. Ted Weir, the oldest of the Yuba County Five, had been known to be kind and fun-loving. He had no issue talking to strangers, and he wanted to be liked by everyone. He had curly brown hair, brown eyes, and was known to sport a mustache. He was born originally in a small town, Prescott, Arizona. And according to Dorothy Weir Dornan, the youngest sister of Ted Weir, the discovery that Ted was using air quotes different from other people was made at the time that he was born. He was also born without knee joints, which would lead to him being bullied severely in school. He had physical and cognitive limitations. Ted was also not a violent person, but he had a mean throw, according to his family. It didn't take much to make him mad either, but he was not considered to be violent in any way, shape, or form. He loved Pepsi, Langendorf cookies, cakes, and macaroni and cheese. He also enjoyed bowling, roller skating, bike riding, dancing, he played mini golf, and he participated in Special Olympic events, so he was a pretty active guy. He was also able to, despite being born without knee joints, walk for really long distances. He enjoyed long walks during the day, but he also, according to his family, had a poor sense of direction. He would walk to Bill Sterling's home, about seven miles away, but he was also afraid of the dark, so he didn't like being out at night. If Ted Weir were to get lost, he knew to call his house from a payphone. Ted would earn his diploma by taking night school classes. He also worked various odd jobs. At one point, he was a janitor at Yuba Gardens Middle School. Another time, he worked at a snack counter at an office. They would always come up with more money than they should at the end of the night, and they would eventually find out this was because Ted wasn't taking out his tips. He thought this was stealing. When Ted would go missing, he was working as a laborer for Pacific Gas and Electric. He was also dating a woman who was given a pseudonym in records, Shirley Lancaster. While Ted was never formally diagnosed with anything, his family has speculated he may have been on the autism spectrum. He was really good at remembering facts that his family couldn't remember. His spelling and his writing were normal compared to people his age. He was also very artistic, but according to his family, he struggled with common sense. An example that his family provided is that one time in 1967, their family home caught fire while Ted was sleeping in his bedroom. When his family would try to get him awake and get him out of the house, Ted seemed more interested in getting a good night's sleep because he didn't want to be late for work the next morning. So he didn't really understand the danger of the fire. But his family would say later, this would lead him to be very scared of fires. Ted's mother, Imogene, also believed that Ted could be easily persuaded by other people. Jack Madruga was Portuguese. He would be just 11 years old when he would lose his father, who passed away from a heart attack. Melba, Jack's mother, would after this rely on Jack heavily, and she would call him Doc. Doc Madruga was known to be emotionally introverted, quiet, sensitive, smart, and kind. He had two brothers, Rick and George, and a sister named Kathy. They were all incredibly close, and they did a lot of outdoor activities together, including hiking, camping, and fishing. They would also go to movies, sporting events, and concerts together. Madruga heavily enjoyed sports like basketball, baseball, and swimming, and he liked going on trips with his family. He did not drink alcohol, and he was known to watch out for his friends to make sure that they were being safe. He also really loved music, like Neil Diamond, Country Western. He loved the Supremes, rock and roll, and his favorite restaurant was Taco Bell. Madruga would struggle in school. He was never diagnosed with any type of disability, but his family has wondered, similar to Ted Weir's family, if he was on the autism spectrum. Madruga would later spend about two years in the army, but he didn't have any type of special training or survival training. He was responsible for driving trucks, and he would later be honorably discharged. He would later become the owner of his pride and joy 
a white over light blue two-door 1969 Mercury Montego sedan. The vehicle would take the five that evening that they would disappear. Madruga took great care of his car, and he was very strict about the rules while he was driving. There was no beer allowed inside the vehicle. He didn't appreciate backseat drivers telling him what to do. And we do know at some point Madruga got some type of mental health service at a local outpatient facility, but it's not clear why. His family would say that Madruga was very capable of making reasonable judgments, and he was not known to be a follower. He would also always notify his parents if he had plans to go out somewhere. He would call his mother if he was ever running late. So it sounds like he was very reliable. William Bill Lee Sterling was born in Marysville and was one of four children. He had a brother named David and twin sisters named Deanna and Debbie. Very little is known about Sterling and his family because they have understandably been very private since his disappearance. He was remembered for being incredibly kind. His family has been known as a typical blue-collar family. And it is known that from ages 8 to 19, Bill Sterling would spend an unspecified amount of time in two mental institutions. According to Sterling's mother, Juanita, Bill Sterling was hyperactive. He could be viewed as a danger if people got in his way. And at one time, he stayed at Napa State Hospital when he was younger. During this time he was there, we do know that he got into some type of physical altercation with another patient. But according to what we know about this event, a custodian caught him a moment or two away from possibly taking someone's life. Juanita would go on to explain, though, that this patient had possibly sexually assaulted Sterling, and so Sterling was trying to defend himself. So if that's the case, good for him. We also know that when Bill Sterling was just 11 years old, he was reported missing by his family, but he would show up later that same day. But it seems that by the time Bill Sterling turned 19, he had received proper resources and treatment, and he would live with his parents after that without any type of incident. For a short time, Bill Sterling and Doc Madruga worked together in a dish room at Sunsweet Growers in 1976. Sterling and Madruga were very close, and they spent a lot of time together. Sterling was also an avid walker, like Ted Weir. He was known to cover nine miles a day, and he was a member of a bowling league known as the Pen Pickers. He was also active in church. He went to a couple of churches throughout the area, and in his young adult life, he joined the California Christian Singles. Jackie Hewitt was born in 1953 in Eureka, California. Hewitt would not meet his father until he was two years old because he was serving overseas in the military. When his father would meet Jackie, according to him, he would say that Jackie, using air quotes, wasn't right. He would scream any time that his father entered the room, and so they took him to see a doctor, and the doctor would advise the family that Hewitt was, again, using air quotes, retarded. Not a word that I like to use, but this word will come up in the case. It is not a word that is in my vocabulary. I want to make that very clear. Intellectually disabled is the proper term to use in this day and age, but it was a common term to use in the 70s. And it is unfortunately how these men were inaccurately labeled in the media. So just kind of putting that out there up front. Jackie Hewitt would participate in everything that his family did. He liked hunting, fishing, and camping. He also had a Yamaha motorcycle that he was fond of and enjoyed riding, so he was able to drive that around safely. He was also able to drive a car, though he did not have a driver's license. He liked to roller skate, mini golf, bowl, and play basketball. He was also actively involved, like Ted Weir, in the Special Olympics. Similar to the other boys, he was also an avid walker, though he was asthmatic, so he had to keep an inhaler with him. He was enrolled in a variety of special education programs. We do know that Jackie Hewitt had some difficulty writing. He also had some type of articulation disorder, 
which was commonly called a speech impediment back then. There were reports as well of Jackie having a low IQ, but his family has disputed this. He was also a very talented athlete, and him and Ted Weir were pretty much attached at the hip. They were best friends. According to the Weirs and the Hewitts, they would spend tons of time together, basically every day together. If Jackie ever needed to call home, he didn't really like talking on the phone, perhaps because of his articulation disorder, so he would often have Ted Weir make phone calls for him. The last of the five that we're going to talk about is Gary Mathias. Mathias was born in 1952 in Scotia, which is a small community near Eureka. Gary's parents would separate pretty early on. His early years were full of mischief and adventure, according to his family. He loved the show Howdy Doody as a child, so he would kind of run around the house in a Howdy Doody cowboy suit, and he also loved Superman. He did have an accident when he was younger, which I felt was relevant. He jumped off of his great-grandmother's house, and he ended up in a body cast for about a year. There was also another accident where he jumped out of a moving car and he hit his head on the road. He did have some type of head injury because he would end up nearly going blind from the damage. He had to wear really strong glasses afterwards. But Gary was intelligent. He would later join the military. Uh, he was the lead singer of a rock and roll band called The Fifth Shade. He played the harmonica. He was an athlete at Marysville High School when he was younger. Uh, he would also, during this time, play football. He liked to roller skate, bowl. He liked being out in the snow. But when he was 16, he would begin to experiment with drugs. It seems like this may have been some form of self-medicating because Gary Mathias would later be diagnosed with schizophrenia. He enlisted in the army when it was 1971, and this would end up being why he would be diagnosed, because he was having a lot of difficulty during his time serving. So because of this, he would be sent back to California sometime in 1972, where he would be hospitalized in a mental health facility of some sort. He would not get any type of proper medication for his schizophrenia until 1975, which I cannot imagine how difficult that must have been for him. During this three-year period, we do know that Matthias dealt with pretty significant psychosis, delusions, disorganized thinking, and hallucinations. Before I get into more background about Gary Mathias, I do want to make it clear that despite everything you are about to hear, while it is awful, I do not think that Gary Mathias was involved in the disappearance of the Yuba County Five. He has kind of become the scapegoat in this case, and we'll talk about more about why I don't think he was involved uh, in parts two and three, but that still doesn't excuse the things that he did. So around 1968, Gary Mathias was investigated as a suspect in some local burglaries, but he was never arrested. He was also involved in a couple of physical altercations in 1972 with some other local kids. He was sent to the Letterman Army Hospital in the 70s, but he escaped and he walked 130 miles all the way back to Oliverst, California. The Army would report Gary Mathias as AWOL in 1973. He went missing for several weeks until a citizen would contact the Yuba County Sheriff's Department about an attempted rape. So, according to police reports, Gary Mathias went into a male acquaintance's home on February 3rd, 1973. They were going to hang out and watch TV. And at one point, according to this acquaintance, Matthias stood up, said he had to go to the bathroom. When the acquaintance realized Matthias had been gone for some time, he went up to go see what Matthias was doing. And he would find Gary Matthias in his bedroom on top of his wife, fondling her. He would then jump off the bed and take off when he was caught. 
Matthias would later be arrested, and on February 11th, police would find him naked in his cell, causing a scene. When they attempted to get Matthias to calm down, he would end up escaping from his cell, and he ran down the hallway, punching a cop in the face. He would later plead guilty to battery of a police officer, while the second charge of intent to commit rape was dropped. Gary Mathias would be sentenced to six months in Yuba County Jail. December 1973, a woman would call police, reporting that Mathias was stalking her and following her around her home. He also threatened to physically harm the woman's three-year-old child. In 1974, Gary Mathias would be admitted to a state hospital where he would quickly escape, climbing down an external drain pipe in his hospital gown. He managed to hitchhike all the way back to Olivehurst. He was also involved in a hit and run with another vehicle and was found driving without his driver's license. He became belligerent with police and was arrested once again, but he would later enroll in college. So it seems like in 1974, he was trying to turn his life around, but he still was not being properly medicated for his schizophrenia. So he would struggle and he wouldn't be able to keep up with his classes. He ended up failing out. He would run away again around this time, and it seems like this was because he was afraid of his father being upset with him for him failing out of school. So he went to Oregon for a while to be with his grandmother. He was gone for five weeks during this whole time, and he admitted that he survived by stealing milk off of people's porches, because remember, this is when... The milkman used to come deliver milk to your house, and he would also eat dog food off of people's porches. So Gary Mathias could walk for incredibly long distances. It seemed like he had good survival skills, and this will play into the story later. So those five weeks would pass before Gary Mathias would finally show up back on his family's doorstep, and it's estimated Gary Mathias would have walked over 500 miles during this time. In April of 1975, 22-year-old Mathias would be arrested for breaking into a home while a couple was sleeping. The couple would awake to Gary Mathias in their bedroom. When the male homeowner would ask Mathias what he was doing in their house, he would say, I want my ring. I'm looking for Satan. He's got my ring. Later, when Matthias was asked why he broke into the family's home, he would tell officers that he was the landlord and he had come to collect rent. So I share all of this with you to show that mental illness is not pretty, but this is what happened. Gary Matthias had schizophrenia and he was unmedicated for years. So day after day, he was living with delusions, paranoia, intense psychosis, and hallucinations. It does not excuse what he did, but it's very important context to keep in mind. We also know that once his family got him involved in programs around 1975 at Sutter Yuba Mental Health, things would significantly turn around for him. He would be medicated and become a functioning individual in society, he was on strict doses of prolixin slash plixin, stelazine, and cogentin or cogentin. So if he missed any of these doses, he would become irrational and experience hallucinations. But when he was on these medications, he seemed to be doing fine. Matthias would eventually become involved in gateway projects because they helped individuals with mental illness as well as mental disabilities. And he would become incredibly close with the four other men. He was known to stick up for them any time that there was a conflict. And in the words of Tony Wright, author of Things Aren't Right, quote, Gary Mathias had something to do with their disappearance was one of the first thoughts I had about the fate of the Yuba County Five. My opinion came from a place where I knew little about schizophrenia. I took time to learn more about schizophrenia. That research changed my opinion regarding Matthias. I understood more about how people manage their lives with medication. It was important to learn how people with schizophrenia deal with delusions and hallucinations. 
Gary Mathias is the scapegoat of this case due to his schizophrenia. Many people assume that Mathias had a psychotic episode the night the men went missing. Yuba County, located in Central Valley, California, is one of California's original counties. It was formed in 1850, at the time of statehood. The county lies along the western slope of the Sierra Nevadas, and the area has become a prominent territory for hydroelectric power plants and agriculture. Today, the population of Yuba County is around 84,000 people, and is predominantly made up of white and Latino communities. But in the late 60s and early 70s, there were disturbing things happening in the Yuba City, Marysville area. For example, a serial killer by the name of Juan Corona was wreaking havoc, with a grand total of 25 victims as far as we know. Corona had been committed in 1956 to the DeWitt General Hospital in Auburn, where he was later diagnosed with schizophrenia. He was considered at that time to be one of the worst serial killers in United States history, and he would be sentenced to life in prison in 1973, five years before the Yuba County Five would vanish. Less than 10 months later, two young girls, 13 years old, named Doris Derryberry and Valerie Lane would be murdered. They were shot point blank and they were also assaulted. Their case would remain cold for decades. In 1976, one of the worst bus accidents in United States history would take place in Martinez, California. There were 57 Yuba City High School students inside, and this tragic accident would result in the death of 29 people. There were also high levels of unemployment, illegal drug activity, and crime in Yuba City. It seemed Gateway Projects Incorporated was a light at the end of the tunnel for Yuba. Their main facility earned contracts with local businesses. There, they would reupholster furniture, build items for mobile homes, and provide education to the mentally ill and intellectually disabled. Robert Sutherland, owner at that time of Gateway Projects, had one goal in mind, to provide these people with more education and job skills. Sutherland had taken notice that intellectually disabled individuals after high school often had little to no resources. They couldn't learn life skills and community integration. It was like once they left their first 12 grades, there was no help for them. So that is why Sutherland started Gateway Projects. The program would end up helping hundreds, but someone seemed to have it out for Gateway Projects. During the early morning hours of February 18, 1975, a fire would damage one of the Gateway facilities. While the fire did not result in a complete loss of equipment, there was extensive damage, and a new facility would have to be built. At that time, perhaps Sutherland and his employees saw this as an accident, some type of crazy fluke, but that would very quickly change. Not long after this fire, a Molotov cocktail would be thrown into another gateway facility. A bomb threat would be called at another. And around 8.30 p.m. on April 6, 1975, the body of Donald Garrett, Gateway Project's director, would be found face down in his apartment, dead. He had been set on fire. The day before, Gateway staff had thrown him a birthday party. After an autopsy was done, it would be found there was no evidence of any other injury to Garrett's body, aside from the severe burns. It was clear that someone was terrorizing Gateway projects. Law enforcement at this time would become interested in a possible link between Garrett's death and the other incidents at Gateway. However, law enforcement would say very little about this publicly. After an unofficial gag order from the Sutter County District Attorney, H. Ted Hansen, Hansen himself would say, quote, We know what happened, but we don't know if there was a crime at this point. 
end quote. A man was set on fire. A building was set on fire. Bomb threats were made. In what world is that not a crime? One evening in early June 1975, a party would be thrown at a Gateway staff member's home. As the night would go on, they would smell smoke coming from outside. They would discover two of the Gateway employees' cars had been set on fire. After Gateway would welcome their new director, Don Larson, he would also find his car in his carport at his apartment torched. This would happen on July 7th, 1975. Meanwhile, Gateway facilities were continuing to get threatening phone calls from an unknown male saying someone there would be their next target. Newspapers began comparing these fires to the terror of the Juan Corona case, the serial killer. July 25th, another fire would occur. Another Gateway staff member's car had been torched. It would be discovered gasoline had been poured all over the floorboards, and there was a lit book of matches that was dropped on top. At this time, police had at least one suspect that they were looking at, but the suspect has never been revealed, and no arrests have been ever been made about this case. In August 1975, the attacks would mysteriously end. And this, interestingly enough, was around the time that Ted Weir, Jack Madruga, and Jackie Hewitt would join Gateway Projects. With Gary Mathias arriving sometime later, and the time of Bill Sterling's arrival to Gateway Projects is unknown. But the perpetrator for these fires, and Donald Garrett's killer, were never found. And some people speculate they could have still been roaming the area three years later, at the time that the Yuba County Five would vanish. Bill Sterling's mother would recall Bill and Jack Madruga hanging out at the Sterling's home during the day. It was between 6 and 6.30 p.m. when they would leave for the Chico basketball game. It was around 54 degrees that day, so some of the men wore light jackets after their parents insisted. Sterling's parents would see him and Madruga at their local gas station, and Madruga would put $3 worth of gasoline into the Montego, about five gallons worth of gas. Madruga and Sterling then drove east to pick up the other three men. This has been corroborated by their families. They picked up Ted Weir first, then Gary Mathias, then Jackie Hewitt. According to all of the men's families, February 24th, 1978 was just like any other day. The men were following their typical routines, and nothing appeared out of the ordinary. The five would drive to Chico, which would take about an hour, and the tip-off for the basketball game was scheduled for 7.45 p.m. It would end up being an incredible basketball game. UC Davis would win by a final score of 98 to 86. The game would end sometime before 10 p.m., and the men would stop on their way home at Bears Market in Chico, roughly eight minutes from the gymnasium. The men got a variety of snacks and drinks. Perhaps they were celebrating, and this was confirmed by the store worker who was getting ready to close up. And... That is the last thing we know for certain as far as the whereabouts and the timeline of the Yuba County Five. After that, everything else is just speculation. After getting back into Madruga's car, it is believed that the Five took Highway 99 out of Chico, and at some point we do know Madruga's car ended up in Oroville. Madruga then took Oroville Quincy Highway northeast, where they would end up in the Plumas National Forest. The Plumas National Forest is absolutely massive. It takes up over 1 million acres, and it's located in the northern part of the Sierra Nevadas. Before it was established as the Plumas National Forest Reserve in 1905, it was used by Native Americans for at least 8,000 years. It was the homeland of the Mountain and Konkau Maidu Native American tribes. Washoe and Paiute also lived along the forest's current eastern boundaries. The ruggedness of the area discouraged exploration until the gold rush. 
Spanish exploration in the early 1800s was limited to the Sacramento Valley. The Hudson Bay Fur Company, however, had entered the Plumas by the early 1830s. Gold miners also went into the areas, which later led to a variety of abandoned mines. Although Native Americans had known about the Sierra's lowest pass of the Plumas for centuries, James Beckworth, an African-American mountain man, did not formally discover it until 1851. Immigrants and miners would move through this pass into the area more and more. Gold mining camps and towns would spring up almost overnight as miners would search for that elusive metal. It would be in 1907 that this area would actually become a national forest, and it became a popular place for hiking, camping, fishing, and other outdoor activities. But visitors who frequent the Plumas know that they need to be weary of this area, especially in the wintertime and especially at night. And that is when the five men would enter the Plumas. And in order to get to this area, the Yuba County Five would have had to have driven across treacherous, unpaved roads. There was snow on the ground and snow banks surrounding the roads. It would have been pitch black. The winding roads that the Yuba County Five would take in Madruga's prized two-door Montego would lead to high elevation. It would have also been incredibly obvious to the men that they were going the wrong way. And remember, Jack Madruga knew the route home. According to his mother, he had taken this drive before. Looking at a map from Chico to Yuba City, it was quite literally a straight shot from the university home. For Madruga and the other four men to have ended up in the Plumas National Forest, they would have pretty much had to have intentionally driven in the complete opposite direction. And why would they do this? With their basketball tournament being early the next morning, and with them being so strict with their routine, with Jack Madruga being so careful with his car, but Madruga's car, for whatever reason, would end up in the desolate plumas up a dirt road near Rogers Cow Camp. They would have had to have driven over an hour from Chico to get to this location. It's then believed that the car became stuck in about five to six inches of snow and that the five exited the car. And one of the biggest questions in this case is just what the hell happened after that, what happened next on that cold and unforgiving mountain and the pitch black is entirely speculation. It has baffled investigators and true crime enthusiasts for decades. The case has led to dozens of theories, but after all of the content that I went through, the books, the articles, everything, I've gathered there's not a single theory that doesn't have holes in it. But here's what I'll say, with about 99% certainty. The Yuba County Five were not alone on that mountain that night. It is believed by many Yuba County Five would encounter a stranger. And this stranger would be the last person to see these men alive. His name was Joseph Schoen. And we'll learn more about Schoen in part two. Be sure to tune in next week for part two to the Yuba County Five. In part two, we will dive much more into the investigation. We'll learn all about Joseph Shones and what he may or may not have known. We'll also talk about many other strange sightings in part two of the Yuba County Five. And in part three, we'll wrap everything up and get into theories. I want to say thank you again to Scott, a patron, a member of the Perplexed Society, for requesting that I cover this case. And that's one of the benefits of becoming a patron, is if you make a request, it gets moved to the front of the queue. And if you are so perplexed and you want to support me, you can get on the Patreon. Join the Perplexed Society for exclusive bonus content, a shout-out on the show, a handwritten letter from me, and many other benefits. It's just $3 a month, or you can become a Perplexity supporter, so that's just $1 a month, and there are some perks with that as well.
I am working on a new series on the Patreon called Texas Urban Legends, and Volume 1 will drop the same week that this episode releases. So if all of that interests you, go check out the Patreon. And if you enjoyed today's episode, it would mean so much if you are watching on YouTube to like this video, leave a comment, let me know your thoughts so far, and hit the subscribe button so you can keep up with when new episodes have been released, when parts two and three have come out. If you are listening on a podcast platform, please leave five-star reviews. If you're on Apple or Spotify, you can leave reviews that way. You can also write reviews like this one that I got from MJ Dolls Shaw. Sorry if I'm saying that wrong. <laughs> Kadra is such a charm. Recently have been diving into this amazing show. She's the best storyteller and so well-versed on a variety of topics. A must listen. Thank you so much for leaving that review. Each time you guys leave reviews, it boosts me up the charts. And that is like literally the only way that I get new listeners. <laughs> so please do that if you haven't. And if you've left a review on Spotify, for example, but you haven't on Apple, you could go do that. I'm just saying. All my other support links are down in the episode description as well, like my merch links, my buy me a coffee link. This podcast is solely funded by you guys. So please check those things out if you would like to support. Last couple of announcements, I did want to remind everyone that in 2024, I will be doing a live Q&A. And so if you have any questions that you want me to answer on that or anything else you want me to talk about, send me your questions and topic requests. You can email them to me, drop them in comments, DM me on Instagram. Doesn't matter how you send them, I'll be compiling those throughout the year. And I believe that wraps everything up. You all are amazing. Thank you for listening, especially if you're still listening. <laughs> Hope you all have a great week and stay safe. And I will talk to you next week where we will get into part two of the Yuba County Five. Bye, everyone.